So I guess we're at uh, one o'clock. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had, uh, have had a good lunch and some time to stretch your legs. This is the last session of the Under Explored Play seminar. It's been really interesting so far, but all, also you all know how we like to keep the best for last. Jokes aside, it is with great pleasure I host this session, which we chose to call Challenging Oils. My name is Cecilia Jort, and I'm the Exploration Manager for Licenses in Spirit Energy. In this session, we will get to learn from a world leading expert on the subject of biodegradation through a keynote. This will be followed by a presentation that may turn the concepts of biodegradation, oil windows and timing of expulsions totally upside down. And by then, it's time for some coffee before we get some more insight on the progress and understanding of the long discussed Cretaceous petroleum system in mid Norway and how integrated studies can bring new insights to the table. Following this, Hans Martin Wedding from NPD will host a quiz on dry wells across the Norwegian shelf that I hope all of you will participate in. Now, due to a small hiccup in counting hours to accommodate the time difference between Stavanger and Denver, Colorado, we have to switch the program around towards the end of the day, such that the feedback session and a, a break will come before Alexei Milkov's keynote, uh, which will start at a quarter past four. He will talk about post drill analysis and how a consistent approach may convert dry holes from disasters to exploration wisdom and future success. I'm pretty sure this talk is worth sticking around for. However, I apologize again on behalf of the committee that we had to make this last minute change to the program. But without any further ado, let's dive into the session. It is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Ferriman. Paul is the Director of Integrated Geochemical Interpretation Limited, also known as IGI, a petroleum geochemistry and basin modeling consultancy and software company in the UK. He received his PhD in Geochem in 1987 from the University of Bristol before moving to Newcastle, Newcastle University, sorry, <laughs> as a geochemistry lecturer. In 2005, Paul left academia to join IGI, where he has led the application of petroleum geochemistry. His main expertise lies in the molecular composition of oils and source rocks from around the world, but with particular experience in the UK and Norway. Paul, the screen is yours. OK, thank you very much, Cecilia. I'm sharing my screen now, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, we can see that all right. Thank you very much. So that's uh, a panoramic view of uh, part of Devon, just to show you where I'm currently sitting. This is IGI's offices here in the, in this building in the uh, estate where several of you in the audience will have visited IGI over the years since 1980, well, the mid 1980s when we were set up here. And I'd like to start by thanking the organising committee of the conference for inviting me today to give a, a, a talk on the subject of biodegradation of oil. Okay. What I'd like to do is cover several topics in this in this talk in the next 30 minutes or so. I'll start by looking at the effects of biodegradation on oil and what it is that makes them into more problematic oils. I'll look at the processes of how and where biodegradation occurs and what controls the rates at which biodegradation occurs. I'll look at the uh, use of geochemistry to monitor the severity, the extent of biodegradation and finish up with a couple of topics, a few slides looking at the concept of paleo pasteurization. So the previous burial of a reservoir, which has inhibited uh, biodegradation by uh, reasons that I'll, I'll explain and finish up looking at the with a few thoughts, perhaps about biodegradation in basement plays quite specifically. So the effects of biodegradation are um, many and they are uh, essentially all detrimental. They're detrimental to the oil quality um, and biodegradation operates through the activity of hydrocarbon degrading microbes at relatively low temperatures, so less than around 80 degrees centigrade. And this is a temperature I'll measure mention several times during this, this presentation. That cutoff is not absolutely perfectly defined. I suspect biodegradation slows significantly from about 70 degrees centigrade, but by about 80 degrees centigrade, 
uh, biodegradation should stop as a process in reservoirs because of the heat inhibiting the activity of the uh, hydrocarbon degrading microbes. The effects of this process of, of microbial degradation of the oil is to um, remove selected compounds preferentially and microbes tend to attack the hydrocarbon components first and that leads to an increase in the more polar components in, in the oils including the large molecules called asphaltines that I'll refer to again later in the talk. This change in composition has an impact on the, a lot of the physical properties of the oil and in particular I think you're all probably familiar with the fact it reduces the API gravity significantly. It tends to also reduce the gas oil ratio although you can get dry gas caps forming in biodegraded oil fields. It increases the viscosity, the pore points, the sulfur content, the metals, the acidity, all these things which are detrimental to the physical properties um, and the commercial value and the producibility indeed of, of an oil. So relatively uh, speaking, it's, it's bad news as a, as a process. It also, I should say, uh, makes the work of the geochemist a little more difficult because the changing in the of the composition of the oil means that the geochemist has to recognise that and try and remove those effects to understand what the original oil composition was before biodegradation in order to interpret the, the composition of that oil successfully. So uh, just to say a little bit about this change in the composition with increasing biodegradation, as I've just mentioned, the microbes preferentially attack certain compounds in preference to others, so they degrade them earlier or faster than other compounds, and the hydrocarbons are the most easily degraded and particularly what we call the saturated hydrocarbons, the alkanes, which are often the major components, or typically the major components of an oil. Aromatic hydrocarbons are attacked uh, a little later or a little more slowly, and non-hydrocarbons, the polar compounds, the sort of black components of, of an oil, the heavier components, these are the most resistant and they tend to build up in, in concentration. And that's shown here with this ternary diagram, this is the saturated hydrocarbon corner, the aromatic hydrocarbon corner, and these polar non-hydrocarbon compounds. And I'm just showing some oils from uh, Quadrant 25 in Norway. I selected that more or less at random because I knew there were some uh, biodegraded oils in that, in that area. And we can see that the un undegraded oils plot down here are high in saturated hydrocarbons with increasing severity of biodegradation the saturated hydrocarbons are progressively removed and then the aromatic hydrocarbons leading to a build-up in the polar components of an oil and this change in the chemistry of the oil is what impacts on the physical properties of the oil it's, it's what causes this increase in uh, decrease in api gravity increase in viscosity and so on we can also look at the molecular composition of the oil uh, and I've tried not to show too many chromatograms in this uh, talk because I'm aware it's a largely non-geochemical audience, but uh, I will show a couple on a couple of the slides later on. This is a gas chromatogram of an undegraded oil. Gas chromatography is a, is a technique where an oil is injected onto a large column uh, or long column in an instrument called a gas chromatograph and it separates the oil out into individual peaks which are then detected by either a, a flame detector in the case of a GC or it can be connected to a mass spectrometer to give us much more detailed information about the compounds that are present. But this is a fingerprint of an undegraded oil and these major peaks here are what we call the N-alkanes, the straight chain saturated hydrocarbons and these are the first compounds to be removed by uh, biodegrading microbes. And with moderate biodegradation, all these N-alkanes are removed and we can end up with an oil that looks rather more like this. And I'm sure you can appreciate that this is very distinctive. So we can recognize biodegraded oils from their whole oil uh, GC fingerprints quite clearly because of this preferential removal of the N-alkanes. And it leaves behind some of the branched and cyclic compounds, such as these in here, pristane and phytane, which are now enhanced in abundance because all the, these other components have been removed. 
We also see a rise in the baseline, and this is due to the presence of what we call a, a UCM, which is an unresolved complex mixture. It's just so many different compounds present in here, they don't resolve into separate peaks on the, the GC column. This UCM is probably present here in the original undegraded oil, but it's exaggerated. You see it because of the removal of all these large peaks. And we get this gradual buildup of the more resistant compounds, including the ones in this unresolved complex mixture. By this sort of a stage of degradation, an oil may have lost 20 or 30 percent of its mass or volume. Uh, and heavily biodegraded oils might have lost up to about 50% of their mass. So biodegradation not only affects the physical properties of the oil, it reduces the volume or mass of an oil in an accumulation quite significantly as well. That shouldn't be overlooked. So let's move on to the processes and have a, a, a look at where biodegradation occurs. It primarily occurs at the oil water transition zone, or the oil water contact. And this is because the hydrocarbon degrading microbes, which are bacteria and archaea, which I'll mention later what sorts of organisms do this process, they use oxidants and nutrients which are present in the water leg. And in fact, the microbes themselves probably live in the water leg or at the very interface with the uh, oil leg. So they live at and around the oil water contact. And they use components in the oil as their energy source and uh, the water leg is the source of the oxidants and the nutrients that are required for the biodegradation to occur. And primarily, also temperature controlled, as I've mentioned already, we need temperatures below about 80 degrees centigrade. And we can see that the, the degradation occurs primarily at the contact between the oil leg and the water leg, uh, because in many fields we see this gradient in composition with the most biodegraded oil the oil with the lowest amounts of saturated hydrocarbons closer to the oil water contact and fresher, less degraded oil as we move up the oil leg away from the oil water contact. In um, low viscosity oils, these uh, gradients are often difficult to see because the mixing rate is actually faster than the rate of biodegradation. So it mixes out and into a vertical uh, composition. So in other words, we get the same composition oil throughout the the, the, the reservoir. And in fact, this diffusion is what brings fresh oil down to the oil water contact for the microbes to continually attack the compounds that they prefer uh, to target first. And likewise, in the water leg, we'll have diffusion of oxidants and nutrients back to the site of the biodegradation to replenish those that are used in the, uh, in, in the biodegradation process. But there may be additional uh, sites of, of uh, biodegradation. So whilst most of it probably occurs at the oil water contact, and we can see that, uh, we do know that we find uh, uh, perched water or, or smaller water inclusions in, in the oil leg. And if you zoom into this, this sort of view, the water in poor spaces may contain microbes and oxidants and nutrients in the water, which allows those microbes to biodegrade the oil higher up in the uh, oil leg than just at the oil water contact. But critically, I think um, this is probably not going to be a major process because the oxidants and the nutrients will be much more difficult to replenish in these isolated pockets of water than they are down here uh, at the oil water contact, where a lot of oxidants and nutrients can diffuse back to the site of biodegradation. So although you may get biodegradation higher in the oil column, uh, it's probably a much, much less significant factor and it's primarily occurring at the oil water transition zone. The nutrients that are required, are, there, there are many, the, the most important are probably nitrogen and phosphorus, but there are also various uh, micronutrients which are critical for the um, bacterial activity to degrade hydrocarbons. And these are derived ultimately probably from mineral dissolution in the, uh, in, in the rocks uh, around the accumulation. The microorganisms themselves live attached to rock particles, primarily in the water leg or around the oil water contact. And it's likely that many of them form biofilms. So um, the, this is a strategy that forms a protective layer um, and protects the microbes against stress, various stresses. Uh, it also serves as a, um, a substrate, if you like, through which the interaction between different microbes uh, in symbiotic relationships is, is favoured as well. 
So it's likely that, uh, and it's worth bearing this in mind, that the microbes uh, basically operate and biodegrade the oil in a fixed position. They don't sort of float around uh, particularly. They, they can be motile, but they're primarily attached to mineral surfaces and likely in the form of biofilms. I should point out that it's quite difficult to uh, um, monitor the activity of microbes in the deep subsurface. It's not something that's very easy to study. So a lot of this work is relatively recent. And this example that I've taken this diagram from is from just a couple of years ago. Degradation itself is probably linked to, to various processes, but is critically not um, simple oxidation using molecular oxygen. It used to be thought in older literature going back 20, 30 years, that uh, oxygen was required in the water leg for, for uh, biodegradation to occur. We now know that's not the case. Most biodegradation occurs anaerobically. It will use sulfate reduction if sulfate is present in sufficient amounts. Otherwise, other oxidants like iron uh, reduction and, and methanogenesis is also an important process in biodegradation. But we don't need huge volumes of water bringing molecular oxygen to the subsurface. Biodegradation in the deep doesn't um, proceed in the same way that biodegradation at the surface does. So which microbes degrade oil? Well, I, I took some information from this Panikins paper from uh, three years ago, um, who reviewed which types of uh, microbes have been found in hydrocarbon degrading or in oil reservoirs with hydrocarbon degradation present. And uh, I've superimposed that on this genetic tree of life. So this is the, uh, the branch for archaea. This is the branch for bacteria. So archaea used to be called archaebacteria. So these two uh, major groups. And I've superimposed on here in these sort of orange symbols, the uh, phyla or classes where hydrocarbon degrading bacteria or archaea have been found. So it's not so to, to suggest that everything in this, in this uh, class of, of, uh, of archaea are hydrocarbon degraders, but there is at least one hydrocarbon degrading uh, member of that uh, archaeal class. And that's the same here. And the, the point I want to make is that they're very diverse. So hydrocarbon degrading bacteria and archaea come from many of the different phyla and classes of archaea. And, and bacteria. And they're largely anaerobes, not, uh, not aerobes. Some of these microbes prefer cooler reservoirs, less than about 50 degrees C. Others prefer hotter. Uh, and the greatest microbial diversity is probably at around 55 degrees C. And at higher temperatures than this, the diversity falls. And that's probably partly the control on why biodegradation starts to slow at higher temperatures and then ultimately stops at around 80 degrees centigrade. So we have a wide range of organisms present that can uh, conduct hydrocarbon biodegradation. There are many other controls on biodegradation and the rate of biodegradation. The prime one is temperature, um, this 80 degrees C cutoff, but there are many others, the supply of oxidants and nutrients from the water leg, which in turn will depend on these other factors, the area of the oil water contact. So if you have a very broad oil water contact, you'll probably have much more biodegradation than if you have a sort of tilted structure with a very small uh, oil water contact at the base of the column. Uh, water leg height and so on. The salinity is critical, so very high salinity inhibits uh, bacterial and microbial activity as well. Uh, the rate of oil charging, the more you replenish fresh oil, that can stimulate uh, biodegradation as well. And likewise, mixing within the reservoir. If we have uh, faster mixing, then we bring fresher oil down to the zone of, of biodegradation. So very many factors uh, influencing the rate of biodegradation. And because of that, the rate of biodegradation is, is relatively poorly uh, understood or poorly constrained. And um, probably the key work in this area has been done by Steve Larter's group, uh, initially at Newcastle and, and more recently at the University of Calgary in Canada. And a paper from back in 2003 uh, came up with some figures. So they, they um, calculated that the rate of hydrocarbon destruction at the oil water contact was about 0.1 grams of hydrocarbons uh, per meter squared of oil water contact per year. Uh, and that's a difficult figure to envisage. So that's also then converted into some of these sort of more observational characteristics, which that it seems to take about one to two million years 
to recognizably change the composition of, of an oil column. So for you to start to notice that biodegradation is significant may take a million years or two. So this is a very, very slow process in the subsurface. At the surface, we know that oil spills biodegrade on a human time scale in years or tens of years. It's temperature controlled, so it's uh, uh, slower at uh, higher latitudes. Uh, but in the subsurface, it's, it's many, many orders of magnitude slower, the process. And that's because of the inhibiting factors in the, in the deep subsurface. And to remove all the N-alkanes from an oil field may take about 10 million years, maybe five, maybe 15, depending on that very wide range of factors that I showed you on the previous slide. So it is a slow process. These processes are on the, roughly the same order of magnitude as hydrocarbon charge. So filling of an of a oil field probably also takes several millions of years. Biodegradation occurs over the same sorts of, sorts of rates. And also mixing within the reservoir uh, is a relatively slow process by diffusion, and that also uh, operates over these same sorts of timescales, a million years or so. And in fact, many oils that we see, we recognise as mixtures, and I'll come back to this later, with fresh undegraded oil dominated by these N-alkanes and uh, biodegraded oil shown by this unresolved complex mixture that I mentioned earlier. So this is a mixed oil caused by the degradation rate and the mixing rate being approximately equal. Um, because if degradation rate was much higher than charge rate, we basically wouldn't see these N-alkanes and vice versa. If the charge rate was much higher, we might not see this biodegraded oil because it would be flooded by fresher charge to the system. But these mixed oils uh, are quite common. and I'll, I'll show a slide on that later. So in terms of how we recognise um, biodegradation, looking at the molecular composition, I've, I've shown a, a version of this already. We start with undegraded oil, uh, or in this case, possibly very slightly biodegraded oil, with its N-alkanes all present, and we see progressive loss of these N-alkanes, these straight chain uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, and here we have partial loss of these. We've lost most of them, but we're left behind with these branch cyclic compounds, and a few of the N-alkanes are still present. And then with more severe biodegradation, even these resolvable branch cyclic compounds get re removed, and we get left with this heavily biodegraded residue dominated by this unresolved complex mixture. Concomitant with this process and the change in hydrocarbon composition are all these other factors I mentioned at the start of the talk that impact the um, physical properties of the oil as well. And it's also worth remembering that by this stage, this is my estimate, it's not a published value, but just by knowing what proportion of an oil saturated hydrocarbons typically are, we've probably lost maybe 40 or 50 percent of the oil by this stage as well. So the actual oil volume has reduced significantly. The change, the progressive change in molecular composition of, of the oil with increasing biodegradation has been used over the years to uh, make what we call a biodegradation scale or a, a, a parameter to indicate the severity of biodegradation. It's a numeric scale going from zero up to 10 with increasing biodegradation. This was developed by um, Peters and Muldoon back in the 1980s, and this is a version of it taken from a, a couple of more recent papers, work by Ian Head's group, uh, and this is uh, from a paper by Lloyd Wenger back in 2002. And it shows the ranges over which different compounds in oils and gases, I should mention gases can biodegrade as well, as well the, the, the wet gas components, um, the, the ranges over which these compounds start to be attacked with the dotted line and then are progressively removed. And then once they're removed, the bar stops. So you can see that uh, the N-alkanes, for example, start to be attacked with very slight biodegradation, such as the example on the previous slide. And then they're progressively removed through stages two and three. And once they're removed, it means we're at at least stage four of the biodegradation process. Compounds like the biomarkers, the stearanes and hopanes, which you may, may have heard about, uh, routinely used in petroleum geochemistry as for fingerprinting oils and interpreting source type and source maturity and so on. These compounds are quite resistant to biodegradation, which is fortunate, and these start to be attacked only at severe levels of biodegradation. But once, let me go back a slide, once we have an oil that looks like this, 
the biomarkers are being attacked. These are the biomarkers in this sort of range here, and these are the next in line to be biodegraded. So eventually those compounds too uh, are attacked and biodegraded. We occasionally see some slight differences in the order of attack, and that's probably because of the different microbes responsible under different conditions in different fields. And that's pretty poorly understood, it has to be said. At very severe levels of biodegradation, we can get some unusual compounds formed by the biodegradation process. These are called 25 norhopanes, and I won't go into the, the detail, but they've lost one methyl group from their structure, the precursor compound has a methyl group at this position here uh, and we can fingerprint those, we can recognise their presence from GCMS, this is gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, and these are used to identify severely biodegraded oil. Obviously the GC trace alone uh, recognises uh, that this oil is, has been severely biodegraded. This is an example from the UK North Sea. Such severely biodegraded oils are relatively uncommon but, but they are found in very shallow, very cool reservoirs. And these compounds, these 25 norhopanes, can help us recognise mixed oils. So this oil here is one also from the UK shelf. It's from west of Shetland, from the Foynaven field here. Uh, and this fingerprint looks at first sight quite healthy. It looks like an unbiodegraded oil with all these N-alkanes, maybe some biodegradation loss of the lighter N-alkanes. But in fact, if you look more closely, there is some suggestion of an unresolved complex mixture in here. And if you apply GCMS to them, you, to this oil, you recognise these 25 norhopanes, which are only formed by biodegradation of hopanes. So these can only form at very high, very severely uh, degraded oil levels. So this is a mixture of very severely biodegraded oil which is present as this sort of uh, very low level of UCM in here with a lot of fresher recharge, which is probably undergoing biodegradation at the moment. So uh, we use these compounds to recognise these mixtures of oils. When we do get very severe biodegradation, we can do something about it. So um, this um, is a set of seven oils from, from China. This is taken from the literature from this paper here, just as an example. And these are the, the stearane biomarkers in the oil. And with increasing um, biodegradation, it's not immediately obvious, but by the time we get down here, I hope you can see that this fingerprint has changed in composition quite dramatically. And in particular, these three peaks here, joined by the line, have fallen in their intensity and are barely present in this uh, most biodegraded oil. And so the steering biomarker fingerprints has changed. It's been affected by severe biodegradation in these uh, lower chromatograms. In such an oil, you can take the asphaltines, uh, separate them out in the laboratory and release biomarkers from those large asphaltine molecules by various pyrolysis methods. I won't go into the detail, you can read these this text uh, uh, from the video recording, if you like. Uh, but you can take the asphaltines, pyrolyze them and release the stearanes out of the asphaltines. Uh, and these stearanes still keep the original stearane composition. They look far more like the original stearanes in the, in the free oil. So we can generate unbiodegraded biomarker signals from asphaltines in, in oils using various uh, uh, techniques. These are not generally um, done as a, as a routine analysis, but they can be done uh, in exceptional circumstances where the oil is severely biodegraded. Uh, finally, for the last few slides, I just want to um, say something about paleopasteurisation and, and basement plays. Um, paleopasteurisation is a, is a concept put forward um, quite a lot of years ago now to explain why we have some shallow cool fields that contain undegraded oils. And this is an example from the Wessex Basin. It's sitting there, the oil at 40 degrees centigrade, actually a little less than 40 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, the oil should be biodegraded, but it's not. You can see these N-alkanes indicating an undegraded oil. The API gravity is 45 degrees and it's a, it's a very good quality oil. And such similar uh, good quality oil in, in cool, shallow reservoirs have been found in many other areas, including the Barents Sea. And possible explanations for this are very recent charge, such that there hasn't been enough time for biodegradation to occur. All this concept of paleo 
pasteurization. And this was proposed 20 years ago uh, by Art Wilhelmsen and, and co-authors, uh, and it indicates that uh, if we have uh, an uplifted basin and, and a reservoir which originally was uh, temperatures uh, higher than 80 degrees centigrade, so we have burial of the reservoir to temperatures above 80 degrees centigrade and then subsequent uplift, then we have a reservoir that's currently under cool conditions, but that once was hotter than the 80 degrees C cutoff and that this has killed all the microbes in the reservoir and therefore any oil in this reservoir, even at the cooler present day temperatures, can't be degraded because the uh, hydrocarbon degrading bacteria have been killed during this period of uh, previous burial where the temperature was high enough to kill the microbes. And after uplift, there's been no replenishment of microbes into that reservoir and therefore the oil in the, in the structure is undegraded. And uh, that explains the situation here in the, for the Kimmeridge field in, in Dorset. So in this particular case, the reservoir is uh, upper Jurassic in age. It's the Cornbrush formation for those of you who know the area. And with burial, uh, by the end of the Cretaceous, it, it reached 80 degrees centigrade. So the reservoir was so-called pasteurized or sterilized by that deep burial. Uh, charge probably happened somewhere down here or during the subsequent uplift because the structure is actually um, uh, an uplift structure. It's to do with the tertiary inversion of the basin, which also caused this rather more famous uh, crumple zone at Longworth Cove in, in Dorset. So charge was probably associated with the tertiary uplift, and that's after the reservoir reached 80 degrees centigrade, and that explains why the oil in that reservoir is, is undegraded. It does mean, though, that microbes don't repopulate um, uplifted reservoirs and we see this all around the world that even at uh, pretty shallow depths this is just 500 meters depth and very low temperature uh, we don't get repopulation of the reservoir by by hydrocarbon degrading microbes and we have these preserved oils and basin modeling can help predict paleopasteurization and potential for undegraded oils in shallow prospects. So don't write off shallow pr prospects or assume that there's a very high biodegradation risk because if the burial history is appropriate um, and the charge timing is appropriate, then the oil in that field can be preserved with little or no biodegradation. And for the last few minutes of the, the presentation, I'd just like to say a, a couple of things about basement plays. So, as I've just explained, the process of paleopasteurization sort of indicates that microbes don't easily recolonize uh, reservoirs, uplifted reservoirs. So in biodegraded fields um, that haven't been uplifted, the hydrocarbon degrading microbes in those reservoirs are presumably descendants of those that were buried with the sediments. They've not been introduced. We know that from these uplifted fields that are not degraded, that microbes don't get reintroduced into reservoirs easily at all. So uh, in biodegraded fields, the bugs are already present, in other words, um, and the conditions change and oil charges and we get hydrocarbon biodegradation using bacteria that are already present uh, in the in the sediments that have been buried along with the sediments. So what happens in um, fractured basement where you have igneous or metamorphic reservoirs? Those rocks won't contain bacteria originally because being igneous or metamorphic, they were uh, formed under you know very hot conditions with no microbes present. So where are the bugs from in fractured basement reservoirs? They're presumably introduced um, and they're presumably introduced from the top during subaerial or subaqueous uh, exposure of the um, of the basement. But how easily and how far into the structure can uh, introduction of microbes occur? And because of this, I think the biodegradation is much less likely in fractured basements. Or if it happens, there are reasons why it might be much less extensive. Uh, it could be patchy and it could also be less severe in extent. And I'll show that in this uh, couple of hypothetical cross sections. So this is a classic sandstone reservoir here. We have a, thank you. Yeah, this is the last slide. Uh, we have a, a sandstone reservoir here with an oil column and a water column. And we have biodegradation occurring here because we have oil in the oil leg and we have microbes, oxidants and nutrients. So everything we need uh, in, the, in the water leg 
coming together at the oil water contact. So we'll have biodegradation here and through mixing we'll biodegrade the whole oil colony eventually. In a fractured basement reservoir such as this, uh, we might have a network of fractures. Uh, microbes might have been introduced through the fracture system at the top, but they may not extend very far down into the, into the reservoir, depending how open the fractures are, and bearing in mind that microbes live attached to solid mineral surfaces primarily. Uh, and down here we have the, a water leg, and down here we have oxidants and nutrients. But we have microbes up here and oxidants and nutrients down here. We need both to be present together for biodegradation to occur. So I think biodegradation in fractured basement, there's good reason why it might be restricted to zones around the major fractures where the microbes are present and it may not um, permeate through the whole reservoir depending on the specific conditions. So I suppose the whole process could be quite different to envisage in a, in a fractured basement reservoir where we have bugs at the top and oils and nutrients and um, oxidants and nutrients at the at the bottom. There may be some good news for, for fractured basement plays. Um, these are the take home messages. I don't think I need to read through them again. Um, they'll be there in the recording if you want to, to look at them. Uh, and I'd like to just finish by thanking all the companies who've been involved in various aspects of this work with projects with IGI over the years. Too many to mention here. Um, and the organisers of the meeting for again for inviting me uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all the audience for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, we have quite a few questions for you from uh, the audience and I don't think we will be able to answer all in five minutes. Uh, so if you would be so kind to try to answer them in the chat, that'd be perfect. Uh, like that. And I'll turn on my camera as well. Um, I'd quite like to start with one uh, relatively simple uh, question, or maybe not, but uh, Jan-Erik Rudjur is asking, would you always expect a dry gas column in a biodegraded oil accumulation given a competent trap? I, th I, th I was thinking about this, about this particular question this morning, I'm thinking it might come up. Methanogenesis is, is very strongly associated with biodegradation, so I would expect methane production, probably in most cases does depend on which organisms are, are prevalent, um, but I would expect some methanogen methanogenesis. So yes, given a competent trap, I would expect um, some, some degree of gas cap. Uh, but in, in many cases, of course, the gas may be leaks through the seal, depending how, how competent the trap is. And the volumes of gas may not be large, um, so you may not always see a significant gas cap. There there's certainly are many biodegraded fields without gas caps, um, but Intuitively, I, I would expect methane to be a, a significant product of biodegradation in many cases, yeah. And another question. Um, are you really relying on oxidants for biodegradation or can that be done solely fermentative? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, fermentation is, is a process that, that um, uh, can cause hydrocarbon degradation, so it can be present. Um, I, yeah, I, I, from what I've read, and, and you know, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm a geochemist, so it, it is based on what I've read. From what I've read, fermentation is significant, but um, various other processes that require some form of oxidant um, are also significant. And, and often they occur in um, consortia, so it's not a single type of organism that's, that's operating. It can be a consortium of, of organisms that together can, can cause the hydrocarbon degradation that, that perform all the steps required. Um, but the oxidants don't need to be sulfate or, or oxygen. They can be some of these other things like iron um, as well. So um, I, I can't give you a, a definite answer to that question, but fermentation is important, yes. Hmm. And then one that I guess everyone's wondering about, to what degree is the biodegradation reflected in the sales price of the oil? In the sales price of the oil sales price mm. um well it, it does affect the commercial value i i don't know the the figures there um a lot of oils are blended i believe in in you know in refineries so biodegraded oil would be sort of uh, put into a blend and, and used that way with with fresh oil um but it it, it does affect the value yes i, I don't know how much i'm afraid I'm, I'm, that's not my area and then we have time for one last question. Uh, microbes mostly immobile, 
are they buried together with the rock adapting to higher temperature and anaerobic conditions while waiting for oil to arrive? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, they they are uh, mo many very very many microbes are um, programmed to be able to go into kind of almost like long term hibernation, and they tick over incredibly slowly with with just very very low populations, uh, very small numbers, and then when the conditions change and are right for growth, then they will multiply quite dramatically. So you don't need many microbial cells. Um, to be preserved, just ticking over incredibly slowly. As you say, they're buried at low temperature and they end up at, at higher temperatures, so there must be some degree of in evolution um, probably involved in that as well, which is uh, quite a philosophical question about how isolated all these um, reservoirs are. You know, they're almost like isolated ecosystems with potentially parallel evolution going on in, in in the different uh, different systems, but yeah, they're they're ancestors, descendants of the of um, microbes that were present in the field at, at shallow depths, not necessarily at the sediment surface, but it introduced at shallow depths and and just survive over very long time. The population um, declines exponentially with depth, so the bacterial counts are very high in shallow sediments and very very small in deep sediments until you get the right conditions for growth. Yeah. Thank you very much for your insight, uh, Paul. OK, thank um, you. And we have to move on in our programme.